wheat, fat, dairy, and sugar. Four foods that have the potential to be a part of an extremely nourishing and balanced diet and have the potential to be incredibly toxic and harmful. Hi everybody, welcome back. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. I wanna sit down and chat with you guys about these four foods, some of the research that I've done on them and how I have come to practice a nourishing traditions lifestyle. I hope you'll enjoy. Let's start with wheat. Any kind of grains really, but let's specifically tackle wheat. It is such a problem in the United States specifically, but also in other parts of the world. However, countries like Europe still have a really strong real bread culture and you'll find so many people that travel abroad, oh, suddenly I can eat bread, right? I went to Europe and I could eat all the breads and it didn't hurt me and it was great. And here in the US, we have such an epidemic of gluten intolerance and bread has just been incredibly villainized and not completely um, unreasonably. The bread that is available on a mass scale is toxic. It is not the staff of life. It is not nourishing. It is not really giving you anything except for problems. There are, are a few reasons for this, but the main issue we start with is in flour. In the industrialized process of flour, we take the wheat berries, grind them in a high heat, really fast grinding process, high heat, which is breaking down their minerals, helping the oils to go rancid. But on top of that, we're also stripping out all of the bran and just leaving the starch. We separate out wheat germ, wheat bran, the starch all separate little compartments. And then you're left with basically nutrient devoid starch. And then that is fortified because there is nothing left to it. Flour companies will add vitamins and strengtheners and conditioners back into that flour so that it looks like it has some kind of vitamin content, but those add-ins are not bioavailable and often they are harmful in their own right. Something that I want to share with you guys that has always struck me as like the most notable worse offender here is a strengthener and conditioner called potassium bromide. And I'll put the little scientific name and the spelling up here for you guys. This is found in so many flowers. It is not always disclosed. Sometimes you'll see it written, but sometimes it's not necessarily disclosed. It is illegal in so many countries. It's illegal in the European Union, Canada, Japan, China, I think Brazil, many other countries. And in the US, it is completely legal. It is in almost every flower. There are a select few organic flour makers that do not use any of these conditioners and strengtheners and the potassium bromate. But it's something to definitely be wary of because in the 80s, um, some Japanese scientists had done research on mice and rats with this compound and showed very clear evidence over a series of studies that this causes thyroid, kidney, liver, um, several other different types of cancers in mice. So that research in the 80s prompted a fairly widespread ban of this ingredient in bread products in many countries. And the US said, no, it's, it's fine. It's trace amounts. It's usually if everything goes according to plan, when it's baked, it's not that big of a deal. Um, totally fine. So. <laughs> That is a big problem that we find in not only commercial bread products, but also if you're baking at home and you're baking with brominated flour, you're still introducing that carcinogenic ingredient into your home baked goods. Another issue within the wheat and grain industry is just the herbicide and pesticide use. It is a heavily sprayed crop. So then you're not only dealing with the things that we're adding into a nutrient void starch, but you're also dealing with all of the herbicide and pesticide load that comes with that. 
This is why sourcing an organic product that only contains wheat is really important. You don't want something that's fortified with things that are harmful and unabsorbable for your body. Azure Market Organics has a line of really lovely flowers. They are milled at lower slow temperatures. They include all of the germ and the bran and the whole wheat berry. So if you're not ready to grind your own flour at home, that is a phenomenal option. And I will definitely link those in the description if you guys wanna check those out. I started milling my own grains in 2020. And if that's something you're even a little bit curious about, I highly recommend it. It is so fun. The flavor of fresh ground flowers can not be beat and the nutritional value is also unparalleled. There is no question that using the freshest ground flower possible gives you the best return on nutrients. And I also really love that the wheat berries themselves, any kind of whole grain berries that haven't been ground yet, have an incredible shelf life. They can store easily for 20 to 30 years in buckets with gamma lids. So that's an incredibly simple thing to kind of prep my pantry with, buy in bulk, get that discount. And then I just have wheat berries on hand ready to go. If you guys are up for an interesting read, Dr. Price in the 30s did a wonderful series of travels and studies on different cultures and their diets and how it affected their health. Specifically, he was a dentist, so he was really looking at their teeth, but he considered a lot of other health factors as well. His book is called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. I'll link that as well. I think it's a really interesting read and he really noticed a big difference between people who were eating industrialized white flowers, the convenience food that came post-industrialization, and people who were still eating the traditional fresh ground flowers and grains that were properly prepared. So sprouted, soaked, fermented, soured, all of those proper traditional slow grain preparation methods paired with the freshly ground flour, those people groups were not showing the same markers of disease as the people who are eating the processed white flours. Very interesting stuff. Traditional fats versus this modern nonsense. Seed oils rose to fame in the early 1900s when the gentleman at Procter & Gamble found a way to turn the waste product from soy, rapeseed, cottonseed oil into something that they could market to people to use in their kitchens. This was the rise of Crisco. Crisco was supposed to be a healthier alternative to the previously popular tallow and lard. This is really sad because there was such a huge marketing campaign around this that was not based in truth. It was just purely propaganda. It is so sad because we bought that wholesale. Doctors were endorsing it. Everyone was saying it's heart healthy, it's better for you. And without realizing the damage that we were doing, we as a people pretty much switched wholeheartedly into these ultra processed refined seed oils that are super unnatural and really unhealthy for us. Seed oils have to go through a high intensity heat process to be extracted. Then they have to be deodorized and filtered, which is another chemical process that often uses petroleum products. So not only are they going through all of these crazy processes with chemicals, they're also being made with some of the worst GMO and pesticide crops to start with. And then with the high heat and chemical processes, by the time they're bottled and on the shelves, they're rancid. They are also really unbalanced with omega-6 to omega-3 ratios. We need both omega-6 and omega-3s, but having an off balance that is high in omega-6 causes severe inflammation, which as we know is linked to so many diseases. Inflammation is the root of so many problems. And seed oils are very high in omega-6 and not in omega-3. Ditch the seed oils, get them out of your life altogether. Absolutely, anything hydrogenated, Anything that is coming from a GMO crop, um, all of the seed oils, get rid of them now. Switch over to the traditional fats, things that are made by traditional separation. So butter, coconut oil, tallow, lard, ghee, extra virgin olive oil, even a little bit of sesame and flax oils are okay. 
And also I'm gonna put it up here on the screen for you guys, a chart of which oils are appropriate for cooking and which ones should be used raw, like for salad dressings and things because not all oils can handle the high temperatures without going rancid, breaking down, which causes inflammation and disease. So know your oils, know which ones are for cooking, which ones are best for frying, and which ones are better saved for salad dressing. Next up, we have dairy. Dairy has the potential to be one of the absolute most nourishing foods. It has so much to offer, completely bioavailable vitamins, easy to digest. Where the problem comes in is modern practices of farming, practices of milking, practices of pasteurization, homogenization. All of these things warp what is such a pure and beautiful bioavailable nutrient dense food into something that causes so many issues. We have so many people with lactose intolerance, people that just cannot tolerate milk. And I think a lot of it has to do with what milk has become. So let's start with the cow, the very foundation of milk, right? We have bred cows now for high production without taking into account um, things like A2A2, which is gaining some mainstream popularity. That's really cool. I do think A2A2 makes a huge difference in digestibility. I've noticed that in my family, at least. Things like goat and sheep milk are naturally A2A2, and a lot of heritage breed cows still do lean A2A2. But A2A2 proteins aside, where we run into the biggest issue with dairy is in the food that cows are being fed at a large commercial scale, the conditions that they are being kept in, the way that milking and milk processing is happening, pasteurization and homogenization. So standard dairy cow operation, they are being fed mostly corn and soy, but also the FDA allows these dairy animals to be fed basically garbage. They can be fed dehydrated and processed food waste. Even things like newspapers and paper waste are being fed to these large confinement dairy operations. Corn and soy are the most heavily herbicide crops in the States. They account for 80% of the herbicide use. And we usually think of herbicides, pesticide contaminations in terms of produce but actually the research has shown that animal products like dairy and meat can contain up to 14 times more pesticide contamination than produce. Also milk from traditional farming practices has shown up to 80 different trace antibiotics in just standard grocery store milk. And that is something that the FDA is totally okay with. That is not concerning and not something that they want to change. Pasteurization is something that came around in the 1800s. Pre 1800s, all milk was raw milk. That was just the normal thing. All the milk was raw, organic, whole milk. Come 1800s, people are moving to the cities. Industrialization is really taking off. And suddenly people are getting really sick from milk that has been traveling a little bit of a distance on trains and cars and things. People are having cows kept in less sanitary conditions. The whole milking process is less sanitary. The cows are getting sick. There's blood, there's pus, there's things in the milk and people are getting really sick. So the solution that came around was, hey, we pasteurize beer and these other things. Why don't we try pasteurizing the milk? We'll just cook it first and that'll kill the bacteria and that will give us time to figure out a better situation for these new industrialized farms. But that never happened. What was supposed to be a temporary fix just became the industry standard. So now they can have blood, pus, bacteria, little bits of feces, all of these things that in a home scale dairy operation or a very well managed organic dairy operation would be absolutely unacceptable. These things were now a little bit more flexible, like a certain percentage of blood, pus and goo 
is okay because we'll pasteurize it and it won't make anybody sick. Milk is an incredible source of vitamins A, D, C, and E, which are all at least 50% compromised by pasteurization. It's also an incredible source of vitamins B12 and B6, which are completely destroyed during pasteurization. Pasteurization also kills off lipase, forgive my pronunciation here, which helps break down and process the fat. So it's making this product less digestible because it's killing off the intricate system of things within milk that make it work together. Homogenization is a, another unnatural addition to dairy and that keeps the fat from separating. A full fat raw milk will have a cream cap on top. The fat globules separate and rise to the top. That's where we get butter and heavy cream and all those delicious things from. Homogenization kind of makes the globules bigger, breaks them down so that they are evenly submersed throughout the entire mixture and don't rise to the top. And this has actually been linked to heart disease in this word. So it has been shown to be incredibly unhealthy for us, yet it's standard procedure and that's what is done. Raw milk coming from well-raised organic cows on pasture who are eating their natural diet, getting good sunshine, um, goats, sheep, any other animals that are being well-managed and raised on a proper diet, that milk is going to be one of the most nutrient dense things that you can add to your diet. Full of all of those wonderful vitamins that we mentioned earlier that are completely compromised by pasteurization practices, raw milk naturally has wonderful vitamin content. It has healthy bacteria for your gut. It supports healthy metabolism, healthy weight. It's high protein. It's such an incredible food. So definitely worth looking into if you have raw milk available in your area. Um, realmilk.com is a great resource for that, but raw milk still isn't commercially available everywhere. The best thing I think is still to meet people in your community. Go find a local homesteader, a local person who may not be able to sell dairy, but who might be willing to barter and trade with you for some real nourishing milk. Get on those Facebook groups, get out and meet people at the feed store. There are people out there who have dairy animals who would love to share some of that nourishing goodness with you. Last, but certainly not least, we have sugar. Sugar can be directly linked to basically every major health issue that you can think of it has been responsible for so much damage in our culture. When you eat sugar, it spikes your insulin levels, which produces growth hormones, which suppresses your immune system. So with the mass amounts of sugar that we are consuming, is it any wonder that so many of us are experiencing autoimmune-like symptoms? If you wanna hear a morbid statistic, let's check this out. In the 1800s and 1900s, so late 1800s, early 1900s, the average person was consuming a whopping five pounds of sugar annually. Every year, five pounds of sugar. In the 2022-2023 year, the average American was consuming 150 pounds of sugar annually. Now, if that doesn't wake you up to the fact that we are eating completely unnatural diets and the reason that we are so sick as a general population, then I don't know what will. All of these ingredients that we've talked about today are incredibly prevalent in all of the processed foods. It's really hard to get away unless you take the time to learn how to cook from scratch which is completely attainable. Cooking from scratch is not that hard. It is completely doable. You guys, we can all do it. Learning to bake your own sweets and treats and make nourishing things for yourself and your family that are delicious and not harmful takes a little bit of perseverance, a little bit of willpower, but it is completely attainable. You can make the swap from ultra refined white sugar that has been bleached and processed. Look into how sugar is made. It will scare you off of sugar. 
You can switch to things like honey, maple syrup, date syrup, coconut sugar, these other sweeteners that still give you that sweet tooth craving, but that actually have a little bit of vitamin and mineral content that aren't as bad on the glycemic index, that have some other benefits to offer, and use a lot less of them. Look into proper nourishing traditions recipes. I'll link that cookbook in the description. I love it. But also just experiment. I think so much of switching to this diet and lifestyle is experimentation. Take your favorite recipes and experiment with fresh ground flour or organic whole wheat flour using way less sweetener and subbing out a little bit of coconut sugar for the three cups of white sugar that it called for, right? You can definitely make things in a better way. One of the best tips I ever got for learning how to cut my sugar, because I do have a sweet tooth, I love a good sweet. One of the best things that I ever did was doing a sugar detox. If you are committed and you want to switch to this different diet, you wanna eat less sugar, but you still wanna have your sweet treats, you can do that. Take two weeks completely off sugar, and I mean completely, it's gonna be really hard, it's gonna be awful, but take two weeks, no fruit, no honey, no nothing sweet, your palate will completely reset in those two weeks. And then when you add just the littlest bit of sweet back, it tastes incredibly sweet. Our palates have just been so warped to be able to handle these mass amounts of sugar that when you actually take a break from it, you let your palate reset, you'll be so surprised at how sweet something even like dehydrated fruit tastes. So that's my sugar tip. If you wanna give it a try, let me know how it went in the comments. These four ingredients that we talked about today are so prevalent. They're in almost every commercially available packaged food. I strongly encourage you start reading the ingredients, labels, start doing your own research and start cooking from scratch. Everybody can learn to cook from scratch. Thank you guys for joining me for this little chat today. I hope you found it informative, interesting. Maybe you learned something new. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend. Let me know what you think in the comments. And remember that there is a blog post linked in the description where you can easily go and reference all of this information if you want to look at it again. Also, we're really close to 50,000 subscribers, which is super exciting. So in the new year, keep an eye out. There will be a fun giveaway when we hit that milestone. All right. I hope you are all well. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you next week.